Man. You know, um, I told, told the, the staff a little while ago, I had this whole like cutesy way of intro in this whole sermon because like in student ministry, you have to have a, you have to get them. You got to catch them in the beginning or you lose them, right? So I had this whole like story and illustration I was going to be uh, using and I'm like, sorry, you don't get that, by the way. Um, I just felt the Lord telling me, you know what? Uh, you don't need that. Just tell them you're thankful. And so uh, Long Hollow, on behalf of uh, our student team and the students uh, at Long Hollow, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for uh, your prayers. I mean, many of you grabbed a prayer bracelet a couple weeks ago, and you wore that on your, own, uh, on your arm, and you, you prayerfully just every single day went to battle for that student on your arm. And I want to say thank you for that. Some of you gave financially, and we were able to, as TJ said, we were able to experience what we experienced at camp, but not just at camp. It, it's, it's all year long because you faithfully give, and you allow us to invest in the next generation. So thank you for that. Parents, God bless you. Thank you so much for entrusting us with your, with your child. And thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity to invest in your student and to partner with you. And for everybody else, man, thank you so much, Long Hollow, uh, for allowing us to do what we do. We love it, and our team has a lot of fun. And that what you experienced while I go in the videos is just a snippet of what we experienced and what God's doing in the life of our student ministry. So, so thank you. Lots of gratitude for our team. Thank you so much for everything that y'all do. Uh, and don't stop praying. One of the things that we pray every single year when we go to camp, and nothing was different this year, was, God, would you just allow it to continue, Right? You know, because we, we don't say camp is the, is the number one thing that we want to experience all year, because if we do that, then there's two weeks that trump all other 50 weeks of the year, and it's like this one week is what you're worried about? The one week makes all the difference? No, we know that every week matters, but there is something significant to camp. And so every year, we know that when students get there, they're away from the distractions, they're away from the normalcy of life, they're away from just the routines, and they're able to lean in and encounter Jesus in a very unique way. And so because of that, we know when they come back down the mountain that they're going right back into the everyday life. They're going right back into families that don't necessarily support them in their faith. They're, they're walking back into the friend groups and the list goes on and on. And so our prayer every year is that, God, would you allow them to take it down the mountain? And so when I was thinking about when Pastor called me yesterday and he asked me to speak, I'm going, what, what do I talk about? How do I how do I do this, you know? Um, and, uh, and so I was thinking, what a more fitting message than to challenge everybody. Um, don't make it about camp, just make it about us all living a life that follows Jesus. And so today we're gonna look at Daniel chapter three and God's already answered the prayer for us. And I was getting conversation and text messages um, from, from different people and they're like, T-I-O-T-M. I'm like, what is T-I-O-T-M? I get these text messages in all caps. T-I-O-T-M. T-I-O-T-M. I'm like, I look as weird as y'all look. You're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, what is T-I-O-T-M? They're like, oh my gosh, you know what T-I-O-T-M is. I'm like, I don't know what T-I-O-T-M is. And they were like, the kid's writing on their arm. I'm like, will you just tell me what it means? You know, I'm just getting frustrated. And so students were writing this on their arm, T-I-O-T-M. And just to encourage you guys to join us in praying, God's already answered that because T-I-O-T-M actually means take it off the mountain. And so today, we're going to take it off the mountain, and we're all going to have church together this morning. Amen? And so, if you would, join me in Daniel chapter 3. And what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 3 are three young men, three incredible young men who love God, the one true God, and they are faithful to do so. And we're going to see a few things as a result of their life. And the three things I want to give you right out the gate are this. If you're taking notes, please write this down, is this. The first thing we're going to see is they had a faith that defied culture. It opposed what culture was doing. It, op it opposed the normalcy of culture. The second thing we're going to see in your second is they had a faith that was steadfast. So they had a faith that defied culture, but they had a faith that was steadfast. And the result of these two things, Long Hollow is this, is because of these two things, they had a faith that caused a lost world to take notice. And today, I hope that we're encouraged as we look at three amazing young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as I like to call them, the three amigos. Just you just do whatever you want to. I write stuff like that down so I can remember what I'm reading, right, man? So here's what we got. Well, let me summarize Daniel chapter three, and then I wanna, we're gonna dive into it. But here's what's basically what's happening. In Daniel chapter three, you've got the, uh, you've got the Babylonians coming into Israel and they're, they're capturing and taking back uh, young people or people as slaves or bringing them back. And they're basically brainwashing them and they're trying to take full control of the entire 
world, primarily because their leader, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you've studied him in history, one of the most terrifying kings uh, in the history books. This guy was on a power trip, if you will. He was, he was sadistic. He was everything but a good leader. I like to call them a boss and not a leader. Um, anyway, so uh, he's not somebody you really want to follow. And one of the things he did, he tried to brainwash people, especially the Israelites, because he wanted to remove the mindset that they followed the one true God because he viewed himself as a little G God. He viewed himself as somebody to be worshiped. And so in this story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a fun fact, their names weren't, necess- weren't that in the beginning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their names actually point people to the one true God. Shadrach's real name is this. It's Hananiah. Now, Hananiah means that Yahweh is gracious. Meshach's real name is Mishael, which means who is like Yahweh. And Abednego, his real name was Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. So even in their naming, he would point, they would point them to the one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar did not like that. And so he changed their names. Now in this scene, where we're at is Nebuchadnezzar was so, uh, was so powerful that he wanted to create this, this national uh, outbreak of bowing down and worshiping the God in which he wanted them to worship. And so what he did was he, he built this 90 foot golden statue and he had this whole plan and this demand of when he was going to unveil this golden statue. And so thousands and thousands of people gathered for this day. And what he said was, you're gonna hear a series of different instruments and there's music is going to play. And in essence, when the music plays, everybody must hit the deck and bow down. Now, not a big deal. You can choose not to do that. If you don't do it, you're gonna be burned to death. All right, not a big deal, but I would choose to do that if you do. So this is the scene, all right? So here we are, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are here. They're in in Babylon. The statue is ready. Thousands of people are there. It's unveiled. And then all of a sudden, everybody hits the deck. And then these three boys are still standing. So you can imagine in a room this size, if I was to ask three of you to stand up, it'd be very, very noticeable, right? They did anything but blend into the culture around them. And it's interesting because lots of people were captured from, uh, from Israel. It's interesting to, to note this. They weren't the only three that worshiped the one true God, right? They couldn't have been. So in this scene, everybody hits the deck. And I can only imagine, Shane was talking about this earlier. He goes, just act like you're tying your shoe, bro. You're good. Just act like, you know, do whatever you got to do. Blend in. You can, just, you can actually pray to your God. Nobody will ever know. But they chose to stand up because they wanted to have a faith that defied culture. They were not okay with simply blending in, even when those around them who believed the same thing said, it's okay. Just choose to do so. But let me tell you something today, Long Hollow is we cannot have a faith that blends in. Because what we don't realize is when we choose to blend in, it's impossible to stand out. When we choose to blend in, it's impossible to stand out. And I pray that Long Hollow is a church that crushes the misconception of cultural Christianity where it's no harm, listen to me, there's no harm in looking like the world. There's there's no harm in in participating in the things of the world. There's no harm in just simply blending in. As long as you know in your heart that you love Jesus, that's all that really matters. But when you choose to blend in, what it does is what we don't realize is in our our choosing to do so, it causes this, 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 this distraction and this misunderstanding of who Jesus really is. Because can we just be honest? Jesus did everything but stand in or blend in. I mean, he, he hung himself on a cross in front of thousands and thousands of people, and people talked about it for thousands and thousands of years later. So today, Long Hollow, I want to challenge us. Do you have a faith that defies culture? But here's the reality. If you have a faith that defies culture, you're not always going to be, it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows all day, right? No butterflies necessarily, because there's also sometimes there's a consequence to us blending or choosing not to blend in and when we stand out. And what we see here is just that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing in front of thousands of people, and then it gets taken back to Nebuchadnezzar that they had done so, that their faith defied what the king had told the culture to become. And so here's what we got in verse 13. What happens is uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is is, is receiving this news and it says this, his reaction, then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these three men were brought before the king. 
Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden statue that I have set up? And what he does in verse 15 and following, he basically gives them a second chance. And so he walks through the whole situation again. He goes, this is brought to my attention. I really care for you guys. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity not to be thrown into the furnace. So let me ask you again. When the music plays, are you going to bow down? And in that moment, they had a very difficult choice to make, right? You can imagine and I can only imagine all the thoughts that are going in their minds. And I, and, and I feel like, you know, what, did they huddle up and go, hey, come here for a second. Can you give us a minute? Just one, just one sec. Come here. <sighs> Y'all feel that? I can feel it. It's like literally right there. That furnace is hot. You know, are, are they, I don't know. Are they come by, Are they getting together going, all right, let's just weigh this out. And one of them's like, oh, I don't know. The other one's like, yeah, we probably, I, I don't know what they're doing, but I don't think that's what happened. You see, because their faith defied culture. And I, and I feel like when Nebuchadnezzar said this, they, their response was simply, This, look at verse 16. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to the question that you've given us. If the God that we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. Then verse 18, I love this. Would y'all underline this or circle that? It's okay to do that in your Bibles, by the way. I grew up, I was like, I don't know if I should do that. I might get in trouble. Underline verse 18, but even if he does not rescue us. Some call this verse the, but even if he doesn't faith. Maybe you've heard that terminology. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as a king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you set up. Let me remind you guys, when you stand for God, a lost world will take notice. Now, I don't believe that the three boys are sitting there and they're all like, you know, I don't think I want to do that. And you're, you're a horrible king. I don't think they do that. I think that this is also a really good lesson for the young people in the room that when you have an opportunity to stand up for your faith or all of us, we don't have to get defensive. We don't have to put the boxing gloves on. We can be respectful in our response because also when you choose to, to jump in and put the boxing gloves on, you are also choosing to blend in and react as if you're somebody that's like everybody else. So do you have a faith that defies culture? They definitely had a faith that defied culture, and I believe they did this because of our second point. Do you have a faith that is steadfast? Do you have a faith that is steadfast? Now, self-fast just simply means this. It just means unwavering. It means you have an unwavering faith. And in this moment, their response, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, our God can save us. Our God will save us, but even if he doesn't. One of the most powerful verses in all of scripture, in my opinion, because I need to hear this, and maybe you need to hear this this morning. This statement shows that their faith was steadfast because they didn't weigh the consequences of whether or not they should stand up or whether or not they should say, no, we're not going to do that. They simply just did it. But how often in my life I have an opportunity just to be, just to have a simple step of obedience when the Lord's prompted me to share my faith with somebody, somebody or, or to just do a simple act of kindness in the name of Jesus. I sit there and I weigh the consequences. Anybody with me? Man, super convicting when I read this because it's like, wait, you're too, I'm sorry, you're, you're too busy to, to have a conversation with somebody that just simply wants to see that they're known. You recognize that they even exist? That's too, oh, I'm sorry, that's too uncomfortable for you to roll your window down and get, I'm like, golly, that's what I'm reading when I'm reading this. I'm like, Will, how often have you chosen to do this, the complete opposite of this? And it's super convicting. I don't know how that lands with you this morning. I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit, but I just wanna, I wanna ask as believers, are, are we living differently? Do we have a faith that is steadfast, super, but even if he does not rescue us, their faith was unwavering. And let me just be honest, now, we'd all agree with this. If there is a furnace over here and I'm about to throw some of y'all in it, which I'm not, some of y'all be like, I ain't st-. nope. If there's ever a moment in scripture right now, this is the moment where nobody'd be like, I don't blame them for not standing up, you know? Just blend in, bro. Just don't get burned up. Like none of us would probably read this and go, man, what a horrible human being that they chose to not get burned to death. But they chose not to. But here's the reality. As a believer, okay, I'm gonna say this, not as a pastor, but as a believer, as a follower of Jesus in my lifetime, I have seen believers, those who call on the name of Jesus, say that he is their king, that has saved them, waver for far less than being burned to death. And again, I'm not trying to, this is convicting for myself. You see, in my lifetime, I've seen people waver 
I've seen adults waver just to get that promotion. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my testimony aside. I'm gonna change who I, who I know that I am simply to get a promotion in the business. I'm gonna set my family aside as my number one ministry to pursue a career in a business. And can I be honest, I'm guilty of that myself. One of the most difficult conversations I've had in a very long time is the fact that my wife felt that I minister to more people than my own family. That's a very sobering statement, but here's what I did. I, I chose to blend into the norm, just go be everything to everybody else except them. So I've wavered from my faith because of these things. I've, maybe you've wavered or you know somebody that's wavered from their faith simply for a drink. The thing I'm so thankful that my dad, my dad looked at me and my brother when we were younger and he said, I could drink this drink and do whatever and be in control, but I have no control over what you're going to do. I'm not gonna waver my conviction for me to have a moment of pleasure once every Friday night. I've seen people waver from their faith for a drink. I've seen people waver from their faith for a one night stand on a business trip. I've seen people waver from their faith because they simply don't wanna be alone on a Friday night. And that's predominantly with my students in the room. And I love the, this thing that I heard a long time ago is it's better to have a jar full of tears than a life full of scars. We can't waver from the things that we know are true, but if I could get a little bit deeper, sometimes we waver for things that are way more, way bigger than this, right? I remember when my grandfather got diagnosed with cancer, the rock of my family was an incredible man of God. It was hard to have a steadfast faith when I was questioning every single moment I woke up, God, why would you allow this to happen? And maybe that's you today, but because of a diagnosis or something that a, a loss of a family member, you're, you're in that tension of wavering from your faith and you wanna walk away from Jesus because of this thing, or maybe because you're just, you're begging God for a spouse, or you're begging God to save a family member or a child. Or maybe it's just the prayers that you've been lifting up that just never seem to get answered. But what I love about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is they stood in front of the king and they did not waver. They had a steadfast faith. And what they actually show us is this. If we flip the script by following their, their example, what if we all lived a life like this? What if we all lived a life and it said, instead of going, oh, I'm just gonna give in. We said, no, 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 God, I, I'm begging you to save my son. I'm begging you to save my daughter. But even if you don't, God, I don't understand this diagnosis. I don't understand why you allowed this to happen, but even if you don't. God, I know that my marriage isn't great right now and it's a lot easier to do this. I need you to step in, but God, even if you don't, I'm not gonna stop loving my wife. But even if he doesn't, somebody needs to hear that today. Some of you need to hear that in your anxiety and your depression and all of these things that seem to cloud your mind, you're, it's easy to run to it's easy to run into that depression and that anxiety and to sit and soak in your misery rather than asking the God who can pull you up and lift you up and hold you up and hold you and that surrounds you and to, to, to look, 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 no, 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 I know this is tough. I know this is tough. Even if I don't remove this situation, please see me in it. But even if he doesn't, see, this is really fresh and new for my wife and I. If I could just be transparent with you um, for a moment. You know, there's a few years ago where my wife and I walked through a very, very difficult situation in, in our life. My, and, uh, we were super excited, but um, you know, we, we got into this point where our friend group, we, we wanted to start having a family and uh, we were talking about that, how we could raise our kids together and we could you know, plant some roots and be here for a while. And so it was super exciting. We were like, whoa, this is gonna be great. You see, Amy and I had a dream uh, of being able to raise, I wanted to raise up a little boy and teach him all the things that my dad taught me. He, he taught me uh, how to hunt and how to fish and how to do so many things. And my wife wanted to raise a little girl who was strong and powerful and wasn't gonna let a little boy tell her what to do. You know, like she's, you know, <laughs> uh, and so even, I, even myself, um, I'm just, that's just my life. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But she wanted to teach her how you can be a, a strong woman of God and not compromise who you are and not let people tell you who you need to be. And so we were excited. And so we started having this conversation. And, and then I remember, um, you know, Jamie and Chris came to us. They're like, we're having a boy. It's going to be incredible. His name's going to be a Sawyer. And then the baseball team began to start up, fellas. Um, except they played soccer. And I'm like, we're not playing soccer in this household. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> Coach Plummer's here. I'm so sorry. Um, and then a, a few, we, all, we kept trying. And so so um, they, they knew they were going to have Sawyer. And then a couple months went by, and more months went by. We had no luck. And then uh, Aaron and Lauren were like, we're going to have a baby boy. It's going to be Brooks. And we're like, we definitely are having a baseball team. Don't you bring up soccer again, or we're not friends anymore. And I'm raising my kid by myself. All right. And so here's what happened. So then the months began to go on and on and on. And we had no luck. The months turned to a year. 
we began to walk through testing and I remember my wife just giving her shot after shot after shot. And just, it's, just, it's, just, it's a very difficult thing, especially when the year, the year turns into years. And again, I've already said my wife, um, she's my hero. She's one of the strongest people I've ever met. Um, she doesn't wear emotions on her, on her sleeve. She doesn't wear a feeling on her sleeve. She, she, she's a lot different than me. Um, I kind of an emotional basket case. Um, <laughs> It is what it is, people. I'm confident in who God made me to be. <laughs> Let that be said. And so you can imagine when we finally got pregnant with our first round of IVF, um, we were excited, but you can imagine um, a few weeks into that, she would lose uh, our child. And so after all these years, and you're to get all this excitement built up, and then all of a sudden it's like a, another whammy. It, it's hard. It's hard to... Infertility is, a, is just something people don't talk about. It, it's, a lone, it's one of the most lonely, isolating things you can walk through. And so here I see a powerful, strong woman who, by the way, can I just say this for a moment, did not grow up in church. My wife was an, a professing atheist until so she was 26 years old. I met her when, we were, when she was 28. So she had only been a believer for a, a few years at this point. And so she was about to walk through one of the most difficult times in her faith and in her life. But I remember riding home after one of the, another devastating doctor's appointment and I'm crying and she's not, you know, she's like, suck it up. Will you just, you're supposed to get me through this. What are you doing? I'm like, ah, and uh, it's not a time. This isn't marital counseling we're talking about. So I remember driving home and, and she, I'm going to summarize, this isn't exactly how she said it, but in essence, she said, this is the most heart-wrenching, painful thing I've ever gone through. It's, it's devastating. My faith, my, my body, everything just hurts. She said, I don't understand it. I'm begging God to give me a child, to give us a child. But at the end of the day, it's you and me. At the end of the day, it's you and me. They're going to graduate. They'll move off, and it's you and me. She said, so I'm not going to let my faith waver. I'm not going to walk away from, my, from the God that rescued me from the life I had previously just simply because he's not answering a prayer that I have and the desire of my heart in this moment. See, my wife showed me what it looked like to have a steadfast faith. And I don't know who you are in this room this morning, but maybe you can relate to this story in particular, or maybe you can relate to the fact that there's so many things in your life that you feel like are drawing you away from Jesus right now. But I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus and the power of his spirit that he will lift you up if you simply have this steadfast faith. Do not waver in your faith, but let the convictions that you have and the truth that you know and the Jesus that you read about be the one that lifts you up today. Please. Do not waver from your faith. I'm begging God, but even if he doesn't. And I'm here, I was reluctant on showing this, but I want to show you a picture of my family. And I, and I want to be respectful because I remember when things like this happened, how we felt in the moment. So I'm not here to give you some uplifting story of it could be you. I understand that for some of you, the reality of having a willow joy may not happen, but I'm here to tell you that I look at that miracle. I look at that miracle and I see the hand of God and I saw seeing what he did in my marriage. And I'm thankful that he answered the prayer of giving us a child, but I'm so thankful. But I had a wife that had a steadfast faith that said, but even if he doesn't. So don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. And we'll wrap up with this. When we stand for God, a lost world does take notice, and there's going to be times in your life where it's tough to follow Jesus, but God is faithful, and he's faithful if we stay firm. My last point is this, and when we have a faith that defies culture and we have a steadfast faith, we ultimately have a faith that causes the lost world to take notice, and I want to end with how Nebuchadnezzar's response to what happened then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage. We're in verse 19. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He threw them in the fire anyway. So they stood for Jesus. They had a steadfast faith, but they got thrown into the fire anyway. And a lot of us are asking the question, God, why would you allow that to happen? I thought this was going to be a miracle story. This is the first time I heard this story, that Jesus is going to step in. And he's going to rescue him. He's going to save them from the furnace. Why would you allow them to be burned to death because they stood for you? But here we are, Nebuchadnezzar throws him in the fire, and we have to sit here and we have to ask the question, why would God allow them to do this? 
Can I just say it's probably because God has a bigger plan than what you and I think the plan should be? He didn't prevent them from the fire. And here's the reason why. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and he said to his advisors, wait, didn't we throw three men into the fire? Like he's, he's, all, he's like, what is going on? Didn't we throw three men into the fire? They're like, yeah, of course, your majesty. What are you talking about? He goes, look. Look. I see four men not tied up, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth, listen to me, looks like the sons of the God. Long Hollow, let me hear you. I want you to hear me say this. Sometimes you and I have to face the furnace so that a lost world can see, listen to me, that Jesus is willing to step in the fire with us. You see, Jesus is in the fire right now. He's looking at three men who stood up and they defied culture and they stood up against the king, the most powerful king known to man in this time and their faith brought Jesus into their situation. They brought Jesus into their anxiety, into their depression, into their waywardness, into their questioning, into their doubt. And Jesus said, I'm not gonna remove you from it because the world will hear about it one day. The world needs to hear in 2022, on July 3rd, that I'm willing to step into the fire in which you are living in right now in this moment. So don't waver, don't lose heart. Grab a hold of me and let's do this thing together because it may not just be for your faith, it may be for somebody else's. And can I tell you, as a result of my wife's testimony, as she handled this, and, and, and her, a lot of her coworkers or family members asked a lot of questions about her faith because of how she lived through it. Long Hollow, Nebuchadnezzar was freaking out when this happened. He brought them out and his whole attitude changes. His response here at the end is praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in the beginning, he was saying, who is the God that can rescue you? You remember that? Now he's giving praise to that same God, for there is no other God, he says. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. I've never seen anything like this. That statue out there has no power like this. Long Hollow, I want to end with this. All of this, this is crazy to think about. Young students, uh, students, kids, whoever, young people, everybody. All of this, because three teenage boys, think about this, decided to stand up. You know, you can very easily read this. It's a noble story. It's a story of one laying its own life down to die for the sake of the gospel to be advanced so that thousands of people could hear about the name of Jesus one day. And I used to think, how amazing would it be that if, if the, all the believers would link arms together and they'd, they'd all sacrifice their life as martyrs for the sake of the gospel. I used to think, man, that'd be an incredible moment. I think that still is, is necessary. But can I just be honest with you? My attitude changed last week when we were at camp. Our, our camp pastor, Drew Worsham, he made this statement. I want to share it with you because it, it wrecked me. And I want to read this to you. He said, it's easy to say that you're willing to die for Jesus. He said, but I think it's a lot more difficult to say that you're willing to live a life for Jesus. And maybe you're in here today and your whole faith is based upon a destination of one day, hopefully so, I hope I was good. But isn't it interesting that when Jesus was crucified, went into the grave and he rose himself from the dead, that he didn't just all of a sudden go, and everybody went up with him? Isn't it interesting, you ever thought about this? Why did Jesus choose to die on a cross to offer salvation for the world, but yet leave everybody that loved him and believed him and he died for here? It's not so that you would one day die for him, it's so that we would live for him today. So that we could show a culture what it looks like to stand for Jesus, not just when we wanna put our boxing gloves on, but even when we're on our knees begging and weeping hysterically in the pain and the anxieties that we find ourselves in. So in my closing this morning, I'm not going to ask each of you to die for Jesus. You're welcome. I'm simply asking that you would begin living for him. And I believe, Long Hollow, that if we begin to live a life for Jesus in this way, that the lost world will eventually take notice. So if you would do me a favor, if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes for me, because that's what we do in the Baptist church. But the reason we do this in all seriousness is we want you to reflect. We don't want you to listen and soak and then leave here 
not thinking about how does this actually apply to my life? And so the invitation is very, very simple this morning. The first one is this, is you can't live for someone that you simply do not know. You can't. You can't live a life for Jesus if Jesus isn't a part of your life. And so for some of you, you're going, I don't have a faith that defies culture. I don't have a faith that is steadfast. And I, I surely don't have a faith that draws people to Jesus for salvation. And I think the reality for you in this moment is you realize it's because you don't have a personal saving relationship with Jesus this morning. And so right now, I just want to give you that opportunity. I'd be, it'd be horrible for me to, to, to share this with you, but not give you an opportunity to respond. And I'll just be very, very simple. I'm not going to ask you to stand or do anything. All I'm going to simply do is if you are in here this morning, you're going, well, I, I know that I don't know have a relationship with Jesus, but I want one. Would you just simply raise your hand for me? Again, I'm not going to ask you to stand. I just want to, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to talk with somebody about what salvation looks like. Here in a moment, when the band sings, we're all going to stand together. You won't be singled out. But when we stand, all you have to do is slip out of your seat and make your way to the right over by the baptistries in our next steps area. The second thing I want to, I want to talk to you about is this, is you can't live for someone that you're at odds with. You see, I think if some of us really struggle with living a life of faith because we're, we're constantly at odds with God. Scripture says that if there's sin in your life, that that sin separates you from Jesus and it separates you from the Father. Therefore, we have to go to the Father in repentance and ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. We confess the things that draw us away from the Lord. And maybe today you're going, I don't understand why I'm not being used for God or why my faith is just a routine. It's not something that I actually live. And maybe today you just need to you just simply need repentance. I tell our students all the time, my goal isn't for you to wake up and you've done something in college that you regret and you have to find a church to be re, re saved or rebaptized. I want to teach them the importance of repentance now. So maybe today you need to use this altar as a moment to spend time with Jesus and to ask him to forgive you of the things that are distracting you in this moment. I think some parents in the room probably need to grab a hold of their student. Some need to apologize. Some need to apologize for not letting their faith live in such a way and shine in such a way that draws their, their child to him. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I'll let the Lord do what he wants to do in your heart. The third thing, and then I'll end with this. Based upon what you've heard today, what is your next step to living a life for Jesus look like? It's just simple obedience. For some of you, you've seen all these students baptized today and you're just going, it's, I've never done it. I've been saved. I know that Jesus saved me, but for some reason I just haven't stepped in that obedience and today I want to be baptized. This isn't just a camp share celebration and nobody else is allowed. We, 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 will, we will have that conversation and we can make that happen today. Maybe some of you need to join the church. Maybe some of you need to serve. Maybe some of you need to, I don't know, fill in the blank, but whatever the Lord is putting on your heart, what is that next step of obedience for you? So as we end, I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you want to know what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus, here in a moment when we stand, make your way to our next steps area. You move how God leads you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the fact that we can look at your scripture and see these, these real life men back in the day lay down their lives for you, but not just lay down their lives, God, they were willing to live for you. God, may we view this, may we look at this as an encouragement today that it's not a convicting message necessarily, but it's an empowering message to look at the life that we could live, but we simply just lived a life that defied culture, that we stood up for the things that we know are true, and that we actually look for moments and opportunities to see a lost world come to know Jesus through our life and our testimony. So God, may we be encouraged, would you draw people to yourself? Lord Jesus, would you move how you feel led? In your name we pray.